Road from Vineyard has become as fine an expression of what God did in the awakening of worship that actually began back in the late 1940s with the latter rain movement, but for some reasons that are explainable theologically, culturally, it did not have as broad a spread as it might have. With the charismatic renewal, uh, wherever you want to date it from the late 50s with Dennis Bennett into the Jesus movement into the late 60s, at any rate in that time there began to come a spread through the 70s, the spirit of worship, a very significant instrument and that was right here in Orange County through the Calvary Chapel Ministries and the Ministry of Maranatha Music. Spinning off of that has come the vineyard and then other aspects of awakening that have stirred worship across the face of the planet. Let me tell you an observation that I want to make without seeming uh, to pretend omniscience or some kind of cynicism or, or judgmentalism. I don't, I don't feel that and I certainly uh, don't feel anything of omniscient. But the ever-broadening worship renewal, which is sweeping into virtually every sector of the church today, has, I believe, inherent in it with those of us that are most familiar with the priority of worship and its power and the pathways of worship and its exercise. The priorities of worship and its power, the pathways of worship and exercise. Those of us that are most familiar with it, I think, are most vulnerable to allowing either its confusion through the removal of simplicity or its pollution by a subtle pride that can so easily creep in with the supposition that because we understand it so well, we somehow have an edge on everybody else. Please remember that as far as we can understand from Scripture, the central worship leader around the throne of God originally was named Lucifer. There is something about being approximate to the throne and being involved in worship leadership that somehow can create such a familiarity that there seems to be a need to establish your own special identity. Let me suggest uh, something of how that might take place because I've been observing it increasing, uh, increasingly in places that I've traveled. I want to make very clear it's not anything that I have observed uh, here and so I, this is not uh, innuendo. I, I'm with the birth of the worship revival. Let me just take one song one song that is, I think, one of the sweetest, most tender, most heart-moving songs. And to me, it defines the spirit of your leader, John Wimber. Jesus, Jesus, come and fill your lambs. Not only is it a tender song that says, open up your heart in sweet surrender. The Lord's going to come and wipe away your tears. He's going to heal you. Jesus, come and fill your lambs. Not only is it a tender, moving message that draws people into the presence of God. But listen, please. It's a melody everybody can sing. And a very important thing. At a tempo that people are able to access. Now, this is not a matter. I'm, I have an appreciation for the whole spectrum of music. So this doesn't have to do with a guy that just turned 60 talking about music he can't keep up with anymore. <coughs> I expect to be able to sing just about anything as long as I live and enjoy it. But there's a difference between music that can be sung by a worship team because of their schooling, their rehearsal sessions, and their readiness, and singing that can be accessed by a whole congregation. That's a very important distinction to be made. And I have come into an increasing number of worship situations in uh, sporadic occasions that I have the opportunity just to visit in local churches. It doesn't happen often, but it happens often enough. And I've conversed with other pastors who themselves have said they've observed it as well. Then in the last three to five years, there has come from the very fountainheads of the awakening to worship, there's come an increasing amount of music that becomes so specialized in the need for unusual skills, vocalization, is it for delivery, 
instrumentation in order for it to be uh, uh, presented with, with quality. The, uh, the loss of simplicity, I'm not arguing for there never being advancement in music forms. We can have as many concerts as we want and enjoy them all. And I don't think there's anything unrighteous about that. But when we're talking about the corporate body coming together, the word celebration has come, I believe, to be mildly skewed, if not seriously skewed. That celebration is beginning to take on the idea of enjoyment of assembly. Now, I would argue for enjoying our assembly, but when we talk about worship, that's not really what celebration has to do there. If we're talking about celebration for enjoying assembly, let's have a concert, or let's get together and have a great time of fellowship. And those things even can happen as a part of a service. But there must come a time when the bride of Jesus, please hear me, when the bride of Jesus is drawn to a place of opening to him intimately. When there comes something that everyone in that congregation can move with, with sensitivity. When there is not just the enthusiasm of rejoicing, but a passion for his presence, an expression of hunger, an unveiling of the soul. If you'll allow this without it seeming carnally sensuous so that the human figure is misunderstood as though I were talking some kind of, of uh, Freudian concept of worship, hear me please. In the spiritual sense, I believe that what you and I are charged with, and we are the worship leaders, whether the worship leaders or not, the pastor is the worship leader. He will set the tone even if he can't sing more than one note, he will set the tone for the worship life of the congregation. He'll set the tone by the way that he ministers with and partners with those who are the musicians and the gifted ones who are skilled to provide that support. But if the music, if the musicians and the singers become the worship leaders of the church, inevitably something will be lost with rare exceptions because they will become impatient with the commonality of the simple simply by reason of their skills. And they will gravitate toward a complexity, not even necessarily by reason of pride, but just by reason of gifting. They will gravitate toward a complexity the congregation cannot access. And there will not be what I believe is intended in the spirit of worship, and that's that the bride of Jesus, where you gather, comes before him and begins to unveil herself before him in an openness of the soul. And in a dance of worship before him, that unveiling prepares the way for her to approach. And again, I want to caution you, I am not speaking of this in any carnal sense, I'm sure you would know, but the analogy is dynamic if we're talking about evangelism and the begetting of children into the kingdom, where the bride comes and by her openness and the spirit of worship, exposes herself to her Lord and lover, and it allows him an entry point that makes her fruitful and multiplies the power of his life in her. And that kind of worship needs to be advanced. So keep renewed and refreshed, but don't presume. Don't presume because I grasp worship. I can't presume because I grasp the priority or the value or the pathway that it cannot be polluted, distorted, even uh, in, in unintended and innocent ways. Number six, 